In this screencast, we're going to look at some CSS you can use to get a very basic web page. It's not going to be what you would need for a full blown web page, but just an example of how you can apply some basic styles to a page. So let's put this all together on a basic HTML page. We're going to go from no style there on the left to some style on the right there with our CSS on it. Now one thing that you might notice is if you put out a basic HTML page and look at it, there actually looks like there's some style. Like if you, um, The first thing that it says examples is an H1 element, the one styled using CSS is an H200, the other ones are paragraphs, that, and some of them have a, a B element applied to them, the first, second, third, and fourth there. Um, and that's because browsers add their own default styles. So automatically to a page, each browser is going to add its default style. There's a big but. Not all browser defaults are exactly the same. So this is one of the problems we have as web designers is if you just leave it up to the browsers, they might look kind of similar, also kind of boring, but also not really exactly the same either. So that's for one reason, most web designers, one of the first things they do in their CSS is apply a basic reset. Uh, and now actually I would say when we get to your real page, this is a basic reset. This is sort of not for production use. This is just to show you a quick example of resetting the browser defaults. There's much better uh, and more sophisticated resets that do a better job of it. Um, and we'll talk about those in another video. But the basic, I want you to get the basic reason for it is that you want to remove all those browser defaults so that you can apply your own styles. Um, it gives you more control over the page and it makes sure it looks, it's going to be more likely to look similar across different browsers. Okay, um, so that's what we do. This, this particular reset uses the universal selector, something we didn't talk about before. That basically selects everything on the page and you rarely want to use that. Um, we're using it here just to sort of remove all the default padding and margins, which are two of the big things that are added by browsers. Um, and there's other times you could possibly use it, but generally shy away from this. Um, so we took out all the padding and margins, and you see there on the right, it sort of made everything look all scrunched together. And so we're going to go through and style this in the next few. So the first one is our basic page structure. So we're going through and, and dealing with the body element. Remember, all the content we can see is contained inside the body. And so we did two things here. The first line with the width, uh, the first declaration, changes the width of the page. And so you can see now it doesn't just run off the side. So if you don't do anything with the width, it'll be as wide as their window is, which is normally too long. In another video, we'll talk more about typography, but it makes it hard to read a long line. The second line is a nice, quick way um, that you can center a page in the browser window. So this would make this page centered. Otherwise, it's going to be um, aligned to the left side of the browser window when they're doing it. So uh, it's just saying essentially here the margin, the top and the bottom margin are at zero pixels, uh, and then the left and right margins are set to auto. And now that only works setting the left and right margins to auto if you've also set the width. So we're going to add in another thing here, which is we're going to add a default font size and line height and font family. And this means we have control over which font our text is going to be displayed in. Uh, and when you put it on the body element like this, it sort of defaults it throughout the page. Um, now you can see still that examples and styled using CSS at the top are kind of big. So there are still some browser defaults that are being over, that are overriding this here a bit and we'll, we'll deal with those in a minute. Uh, but generally now our font size and our line height, by the way, whenever you set font size, you should also set the line height. And we'll talk more about why in a um, when we get into typography more in a different video. But these are the three basics with um, text, size, line height, and the font family, which font it's going to use. So now let's go in and change those headers to be the fonts that we want. So I, you saw that headers before still use sort of um, a default font and we're going to do two things to change it. So one is we're using a new selector that we haven't seen before uh, and that's when you put commas in between selectors. So the same three basic selectors we saw before, you can use those with commas to sort of add them on top of each other. It means do it to h1 and h2 and h3 and h4 and h5 and h6. So spaces are very different. They're looking that would be looking for H1s inside of H2s and so forth. This is just saying 
all these different elements, I want to style them all. And so instead of having to write six different rules, um, I can just write one that covers all of them. So that's the fourth kind of selector that we I was talking about before. So this is we're just giving a little margin to the top and the bottom. That's not necessary, but um, just something I did just to to show that you can you can do it. And usually, often you want to have more space above something than below to show that the title goes with the content that's below it. And then we made a different font family, um, and we gave them a different one than the body. We gave this a sans serif font versus the serif font on the body. And we can talk more about the sans serif and serif in a and again in a more design oriented typography video and so then now we want to have more control over the exact font size of each of the different kinds of headings so for that we need to go through and add different rules for each of the headings that control those font sizes and line heights so this is just shows an example of going through and individually styling those uh, font sizes for the headers And then we get to our paragraph settings. So in this case, we were fine with usually your paragraph is going to use the same font and so forth you set on the body. Occasionally you might not, but generally that's the reason. Uh, paragraph being the most common element for text, um, it's usually the, that's what you want to set on the body is sort of the default style. But what we're adding here is a 1M bottom margin so that the paragraphs have some space in between them. I'm just going to slip, flip back here really quickly again. This, these were our paragraphs without any margins beneath them and then now here's that space in between them and so it's much easier to read those paragraphs and see that they're separate. Another thing that is very common in a page um, is using what's called a wrapper div. So this is a div here that I've given an ID of wrapper to that you see starts right after the body. It's, a, it's its first thing and then it ends right before the body ends. So it wraps around the entire page and allows us some extra styling options that we can do. So um, in this case, I've given it a background color so that now I can have a color around my text that's different from the rest of the background on the page and it kind of makes the page uh, feel like a little bit more of a separate page there we get a page so that's that sort of light gray I put there and then I also put some padding on it so that the text wouldn't run right up against the edge and that's another typography no nos to push your text right up against an, an edge of a border or, or a color difference like this so some closing thoughts on CSS the first one is that there's a lot more to it um, there's more elements you can style even more very common ones like the anchor lists forms, tables, um, all those um, to, to look at and think about styling. Advanced selectors, uh, attribute selectors where you're selecting elements by attributes that they have. Pseudo selectors, uh, that's for things like uh, if you want to change the color of a link when it's being hovered over. And also we didn't talk about CSS specificity which has to do with how CSS determines which style it's going to apply if there's more than one style applied to an element. Uh, and so specificity has to do with how, where, which, what you use, whether it's an inline style or an ID or a class or just a regular element, um, and, ha and how that's been applied uh, to using your selector and your rule, which one will win over. Also, I want to talk about using other people's CSS. Uh, it's okay, but um, only in a, in a, if a couple things are true. You have explicit permission from them, which, by the way, for me, you have permission to use any of my CSS. Uh, the second one is if you give attribution to the person. Right, so you see there on the right, this is an example of a CSS comment where it has slash and then asterisk and it says this CSS taken from and the link and then asterisk slash. So to do a comment in CSS, which means it's something that you're going to write that isn't valid CSS, um, then it won't look at it and essentially will like ignore that. It's just for humans. So it's slash asterisk to start and asterisk slash to end a comment. And these are some places you might go to find it. Um, Listomatic is on there on the bottom left is a good one if you want to turn it, making navigation and you use a turn, I'll show you how to turn a list into good navigation. Uh, there's CSS Tricks which is a big website. Also sometimes just an article like the one on the left there is just an article about tables and often um, these are good starting points not ending points but starting points to say I want to style this table let me look at some examples and I can modify it and change it to make it my own. 
the last one there on the right is the CSS3 generator and, and I want to talk about that too. CSS3 is the latest version of the CSS specification that isn't even complete yet but people are using it a lot because it's added a lot of nice features and functionality uh, multiple background images and rounded corners and um, you know text shading things that we can use uh, and those are some links about it <coughs> and on the right are two new languages that sort of are built on top of CSS that give it even more functionality than the official CSS specification which is what CSS 3 and 2 and so forth are. Um, they allow you to do more programming type things with CSS uh, and once you understand CSS well it's a great idea to look at these because um, with a good understanding of basic CSS these will help you write it faster and more flexible. So that's the end of the presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. And there will be some other presentations, and there are other presentations on the site, that cover other aspects of CSS and more advanced and more complicated things.